Welcome everybody to uh, week 15, I believe, uh, I might be wrong, somewhere around that anyway, of the Survive and Thrive webinar series brought to you by Sussex Innovation uh, in collaboration with Gatwick Diamond Business. Um, as you can see on your screen there, thanks very much to the European Regional Development Fund for uh, their support and helping us to bring you these sessions uh, throughout lockdown and beyond. Introductions. Uh, my name is Joseph Bradfield. I'm the PR and communications advisor for Sussex Innovation. Um, and I'm joined by an expert panel today to talk all about data storytelling. So we're joined by uh, Sam Knowles, founder of the Data Consultancy Insight Agents uh, and author of two books on data storytelling, uh, Narrative by Numbers and How to Be Insightful. Uh, we're also joined by Ian Jenkins, the Global Head of Strategy, Insight and Intelligence at the Communications Agency for Media Group. And Daryl Berry, uh, who's the founder of Significance Systems, a decision analysis company rooted in big data and social listening. I hope I've got those definitions of, uh, <laughs> of all of you guys right. Feel free to yeah, check in. I'm pretty good. <laughs> Close enough. Cool, cool. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen and we'll start with a few of my starters for 10. Uh, seeing that there's a few people in the chat who are asking whether there's any connection issues, um, do, do shout if, uh, if that's happening for everybody, but I, I'm going to carry on uh, for the time being. So, uh, First, uh, first question is for Sam. I um, thought we, uh, we'd break the ice with a little bit, a little bit of a definition. Um, so the focus of today's session is uh, data storytelling. And I thought it would be interesting to go into how you define the difference between using data for data analysis and using data for data storytelling and, and how businesses can, can go about uh, bridging that gap between the two. So I think I mean I think I think it's a really good question. I, th I mean I think one is a is a stepping stone on the bridge to to, to the other, um, analyzing data, making sense of data, boiling down and reducing uh, data to 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 find what what is underpinning, what is causing perhaps, or what is associated with what we're observing. It's a bit like making a really good sauce or a stock. So you take you know vegetables and herbs and bones if you're making a meat stock. And you put them in the pan, you boil it down, reduce it, reduce it, reduce it. And, you know, halfway through, you'll look at it and it's not, it's neither the original ingredients, nor is it the stock. Um, and you, you know, you do your reduction and reduction. And if you have Michelin stars, you carry on for many hours and sometimes days. Um, and you will eventually get uh, a source. So I think analysis of data does not necessarily uh, have inherent in it insight. And I, I'm, for me, you know, you mentioned... Um, that I'm interested in insight and the use of data to find insight. I think people, particularly in a big data world, particularly when there are many tools and technologies that people can use to summarize data, to bring together data from social listening platforms to different artificial intelligence products, a whole variety of, uh, of, of options. I think many people still, uh, and this is not a criticism, it's just an observation of working with a lot of businesses who struggle to make sense of data. A lot of people will present a snapshot from a dashboard or a spreadsheet or some boiled down data as if that was uh, in some way um, a story, a narrative. I think uh, data storytelling narrative is inherent there. Um, building a well-balanced, well-balanced, persuasive uh, argument that balances, successfully balances the rational and the emotional. The cognitive psychologist Daniel Kahneman, who with his, uh, the author of the book Thinking Fast and Slow, if you're familiar with that, um, with his longtime collaborator Amos Tversky, showed us the, um, we're not quite as rational as we thought we were, as you know, homo, homo economicus is not, we're not quite as rational as we thought we were. We make predictable mistakes in our decision making. Fundamentally, we make decisions emotionally. We make decisions using the uh, evolutionarily ancient, what Kahneman calls system one uh, part of the brain, 
the non-verbal part of the brain. That's how we make decisions. We then go on to justify them rationally. We justify them with facts and data and analysis uh, of data. So I think a narrative, a data-driven narrative, needs to do a couple of things. One, it needs to feed on this reduction of uh, data that we've put through uh, the, the mill. It's, it's found trends, it's found reasons, it's found connections. In terms of bridging the gap between data analysis and, uh, and data storytelling, there's a really good article in January, February 2019, Harvard Business Review, that looks at, particularly for bigger organizations, um, the type of teams that you should put together in order to blend the rational and the emotional, to, to take analytics plus storytelling and putting them together. I mean, I contend that the fundamental um, uh, equation that dogs so much in the modern knowledge economy is analytics plus storytelling or analytics times storytelling equals influence. But I don't think you need a bunch of analysts and a bunch of storytellers. I actually think that analytics and analyzing pictures, numbers, words, making sense of them, and then using those as the foundation for our persuasive communication are two skills that we're really good at. And actually, people are not either analysts or storytellers. They're a bit of both. And there are some quite good diagnostic um, psychometric tests and, and simple tests that one can run with, with teams, teams of one to, to, to N, ideally more than one, to see who is, you know, who's more, who's going to be more helpful at what stage of turning data into insight, into, into story. Um, and I think it's important not to say, right, you're a data analyst, you can, do, you can go and do the analysis bit. It's important to harness and encourage uh, people in knowledge economy jobs to, 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 to do both bits of it. I think those that thrive and survive, to use the words of, your, uh, of this series of talks, those that thrive and survive in a post-pandemic world are going to be those who are able to do that blend of analytics and story. Some are going to be more one side than the other, but, but it's very unlikely that either are going to be both. Brilliant. Thank you. That's, uh, that's encapsulated what the next, uh, next hour or so is going to be about perfectly. So thank you for that. Um, I thought we'd uh, start digging into a bit more of the, the kind of uh, the, the practical after that overview. So uh, Ian, uh, I wanted to ask how uh, you, how do you think that businesses should use data and insight as a, as a method of developing their brand and, and can you give us any, any examples of how that works in practice? Yeah, I think the, um, for me particularly, I mean, the, the idea of insight, it's, you know, it's part science, it's part art. And um, I think the most important thing for any business really is to be continually inquisitive about what, um, what their customers are feeling, what, they're, what the people they're trying to appeal to are thinking, how things are changing. And I suppose I've, I've, my premise is very much that, you know, if you're going to get great insight from people, you've got to stop thinking about what questions you're going to ask. And you've got to start listening uh, to people and finding out what the right questions to be asking in the first place actually are. Um, the problem with a lot of research, with a lot of insight, is that it is predicated on asking questions. And that's absolutely fine. We can all ask questions. Um, the problem is that you can get any answer from that as well. Um, and you can talk to people at, at length and get them to ask the questions that you think are important. But the most important thing is to actually find out what, what you should be asking about in the first place. And that's where a lot of research often goes wrong because you don't take that first step of actually just listening and absorbing um, uh, what it is that the people that you're interested in actually have to say. Um, I think one of the things that uh, we particularly move towards now is, is thinking about context of, well, of, of, of when you're talking to people and when you're asking people questions, because we feel differently about things depending on the situation we're in. Um, and if you talk about you know, a car brand, for example, um, you know, and you were talking to someone about their perceptions of BMW or Jaguar or Mercedes or whatever it happens to be, in an abstract sort of conversation, that would be different than if you were actually sitting in the car with them and going around the, going around the streets, or if you were in, a, in an automotive dealership, um, or if they're reading a car magazine. And so one of the things that we, we really have to focus on in Insight is trying to get, us get to talk to people 
as close to the point that they're actually involved in something that's relevant. So, you know, if you're talking to people about how they feel about buying a product, you want to be talking to them when they're as close to actually buying it or looking at it or um, involved with it uh, as is humanly possible. Because the closer you get to that interaction, the more likely you are to pick up a genuine insight and a genuine feeling about how people feel at that particular moment and how they feel about that particular brand or service. So one of the things that I think is really important is, is trying to get as close to, to that moment as, as possible. And I suppose we're fortunate these days, uh, certainly compared to, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, um, when market research um, really existed around sort of large quantitative surveys and focus groups. Now we have technology to help guide us and to have, allow us to be able to talk to people in those, if you like, those moments of truth. Um, so we have two things. One is, you know, looking at how you get access to people. So, you know, um, Sam mentioned analytics and we can do an awful lot in understanding what the real time emotions and feelings people have about a product through looking at sort of things that they say on social media. Um, we can look at um, talking to people through mobile applications um, and through geofencing and geolocating people to particular, particular places or particular areas that might involve um you know products or brands that they're they they are involved with and talking to them at the moment that they're actually engaged with that that service or product um we can do ethnographic research we can do work which enables us to actually just you know um uh, follow and observe and listen to what people are actually doing um rather than just asking questions and if you ask you know if you ask people about how they use a particular product you'll get very different reaction if you did exactly the same thing but actually just observed what they actually do so i think you know bring all those things together you sort of really are creating a sort of a lens as it were to sort of shine around or throw around people to be able to look at their behaviors in, in lots of different ways and by doing that you get much closer to actually finding something or an idea that will help you develop that sort of better product or that better piece of communication that um uh, new customer experience um, so there's lots of different ways that we've done that, um, you know, with, with uh, you know, cinema chains, for example, um, one of our, our brands that we work with was wanting to find out what that, you know, what is that sort of feeling that people have when they're actually, you know, the, the lights go up after the end of the movie. Um, so we're actually using mobile research to be able to talk to people on their way to the cinema, um, find out, you know, why they're going, where, you know, who they're with, what's prompted that particular moment, and then be able to talk to them once that movie's ended is much you get a much more uh, immersive and you get a much more uh, um, or much richer sense of what their feelings uh, were and what the things are that you really want to capitalize on by being able to talk to them as close to that moment as possible so those are the sorts of things that i think really determine how brands or how companies and people should be using insight you know it's about really trying to sort of talk to people in that moment as close to that moment as possible that something actually happens Brilliant. Um, that's. Uh, I'm. I'm. I'm really glad you. Uh, you touched on that point of. Uh, of not not leading the. Uh, the interviewee because uh, that's something that we we find with a lot of um, the particularly early stage businesses that we we work with is. It's a really hard thing to pull off, right? Is uh, is switching into that mode of I'm not asking people specifically about what I can offer them. It's it's a broader picture, a, a wider lens on their, on all of their kind of habits and behaviours that, that can then inform uh, how how you develop the brand rather than uh, you know telling people what they want. Yeah, and there's lots of different ways in which, you know, before you start, you know, if you're thinking about talking to customers or talking to your audience and you, know, you think, well, I should do a survey. Well, that's absolutely fine. But first of all, it's, you know, what type of survey? What sort of insight do I want to gather? What is it I'm doing it for? Um, often, you know, we will start um, projects by looking at sort of just listening to people, just talking to people, immersing ourselves in their life to be able to build up almost a sort of um, uh, a stream of consciousness, if you like, about what people are thinking and looking at how you can turn that into questions which are both relevant for you, but actually they're relevant to the people you're actually talking to. Um, it takes a little bit of um, willpower to, you know, not, <laughs> not try and bias the things to the things that you think are important but actually 
for things that are actually going to give you genuine insight. And I think, you know, it, the, the thing I always say to my clients is, you know, when you're involved in a project is just, you know, just stand back from it a minute. Just stand back and actually think about what, why, why are you doing this insight? Why do you, what is it you really want to know? What are you trying to do? Um, and let's look at the sort of the best ways in which to sort of use those multiple techniques, multiple tools that we have, surveys, focus groups, interviews, to actually use the right thing for the right purpose. And a lot of times, you know, that the, the danger is that people will just rush in to sort of, you know, we need to do some focus groups to find out what people think. Um, focus groups don't tell you what people think, actually. Well, they tell you some things that people think, but actually, you know, they're much more useful as a sort of creative workshop um, uh, rather than as a way of sort of asking people how they behave. Um, we have, you know, there are much better techniques to being able to do that these days. Mm. Thanks. Um, so moving over to uh, to Daryl, um, you've uh, you've got a, a fair bit of experience. I think it's fair to say with uh, with uh, larger data sets, um, and I think one of the challenges with the emergence of big data is is how we uh, derive those kind of uh, accessible, understandable kind of insights from from them. Mm. Um, so. How do you kind of differentiate between the the signal and the noise when when it comes to working with data? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. I mean, big data is such, such a, a horrible expression. I mean, it's uh, it's either small or it's big. But what does that tell you? What does that tell you about it? Um, I mean, the work the work that I've been doing for the past oh, twenty years or so has really been about trying to extract um, useful models that that go some way to describing and predicting human behavior from big data sets, particularly from, from social and online data. And, and that's inherently noisy and look at, look at the huge volume of stuff that's produced every day. Um, and a lot of it is meaningless for any given purpose. But the question is really, what, what is the purpose that you're trying to deploy you know, your, your data against? And I think the, there's the question of, of signal and noise, but the, the useful focus is really on what are the features of the data that you're, you're looking at that are actually useful for the purpose that you've got at hand. Um, certainly the work that we've been doing, uh, we, we don't really do social listening. I spent quite a few years designing social listening systems for research companies and became fairly jaded by the entire process because really what most people are looking at in the dashboards are, are volumetric measures with this many tweets about that and that many retweets of, of whatever. And um, ultimately that doesn't really tell you very much about behavior. It tells you what's going on today. It doesn't really tell you what's going to happen tomorrow. So um, what, we've, what we ended up looking at is really the, the structure of the conversations I and mean, how do people interact? Um, what do those interactions look like? And that's the, that's the data that we work with. So it's not really whether the data, the original data has got signal or is really about signal or noise. It's about what are the features that you can identify within the data that are actually usefully predictive of the thing that you're trying to get to. So you really have to start with the model. Um, and I think that's the thing that's lost with a lot of social listening and a lot of the applications of big data is people go, well, here it is. <laughs> now, uh, what do we do with it? Rather than starting a model of how uh, people interact or how people behave or how the market behaves that they're, that they're then actually trying to extract from the data that they've got at hand. And that's, that's I think, absolutely crucial is have a model before you start um, and know what you're trying to achieve. And then look really hard at what you're observing to see whether it's actually describing the thing that you're interested in and whether, I guess the acid test is whether it doesn't just describe it, whether, whether it's actually usefully predictive or not. And that's, that's a hard test. Um, and it's actually a harder test than you often need. Well, often what people want is they want data that supports their existing worldview, particularly when you're doing uh, brand market research. Usually what the brand client wants to hear is that the world's the way that they think it is. And um, the reality is often that the world isn't the way that they think it is. Um, so identifying the truth rather than matching the expectations of your, your client or the, um, the brief that you're working towards can actually be quite a, a challenging thing. But I think it's very, very important that we look at the world as it is, because the, particularly in times like now, um, what we will be planning for and what we will be dealing with in the future comes from the reality that people are perceiving or the perceived reality that people are living with rather than the, the expectations of, of maybe brands or, or businesses. And I think the, the points that the other guys have made about um, 
emotions come first. I think that's absolutely supported by the work that we've done. And also the um, asking questions, you will get the answers that you expect. So um, I think it's also very important if you're working with um, social data or research data to see what it is that the, what the patterns are that emerge naturally from the data, um, rather than necessarily trying to interrogate it to get the answers that you want. I and mean, so certainly big data is great for things like CRM. You can, you can get to very easily get to, you know, uh, prospect lists, you can find people that are at, at that point of decision making, uh, which is a really important thing. Um, but when you're looking at the, the complex, deep stuff, uh, when you're looking at the emotional drivers, when you're looking at what it is that people are feeling that's going to be driving their behaviour, and um, very often, as we've, we've already heard today, it's the, the um, behavior that drives the attitude rather than the other way around. You have to have an experience before you really have a, uh, a deep emotional response to, to a brand. It's a different thing to be asked what you think of a Ferrari to actually be sitting in one on a, on a motorway, for example, it's the crass example. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a lot to keep in mind, but I think the, the simple, single most important thing is, well, really, what is it in the data that is going to be useful in understanding the future behavior of the people whose who's data is and ultimately that's the, the greatest value you can get out of it. Sort of a dashboard is a picture of something, but is it a description of the world? Is it a description that's going to be usefully explaining why people behave? No, probably not. Um, you know, the narratives that people build around the world are uh, complex and emotionally driven. And the extent to which you can get to the heart of that, I think, is a really, um, really, really important. And as a, having worked as a practitioner in this world for quite a long time, a lot, a lot of what people base decisions on, I think, is poorly supported scientifically. Uh, and a lot of um, a lot of systems and a lot of processes are, are oversold and underdelivered, which is a shame. I think it's still very, very early days, really. Mm. That's. Uh... Thanks for your perspective on that. Um, I uh, just wanted to say for any of the attendees who are coming in a little bit uh, after the start of the session, please do uh, drop your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen because we'll be uh, moving on to audience uh, questions fairly soon. Um, so returning to Sam, um, what are some of the first principles uh, that people should be looking at when trying to craft a story using their data? Um, and maybe maybe you could give us some views and dangers. That's a, that's, a, that's a really good question. I mean, I think my first would be to keep it simple. Um, none of the, none, none, nothing what I'm going to say is going to amaze you and think, gosh, I've learned so much um, from, the, from the half dozen principles here. But to keep it simple, to, um, to I mean, fundamentally to realise, uh, and I think actually the, the, the trick, uh, apart, from, apart from finding something meaningful, um, not over-interpreting, uh, not being led astray um, by outliers that are either hugely influential or, or, or meaningless, but it, it, it's, to, it's really about empathy and human understanding. If you're going to use data to underpin not to dominate, but to underpin your narrative. Keeping it incredibly simple um, is important. There's a, a football manager currently works for Tottenham Hotspur, used to work for Manchester United, Jose Mourinho. I think he's possibly the world's worst data storyteller. Um, just before he was sacked from Manchester United, he was asked why it was that he had um, not played Marcus Rashford, the hero of England in the World Cup. And rather than say, do you know what? In the last two seasons, I've played him about half the games for about half of, that, half of each game. He gave to the decimal point the number of minutes and seconds that he played the guy. Uh, he was fired about two weeks later. Some would say it was because Liverpool beat them uh, at Old Trafford, but actually it's because he was a bad data storyteller. He gave another example recently. He was interviewed at a press conference and said, you know what t t tell us about this great uh, another english hero harry kane why aren't you playing him enough and he gave a litany of the four strikers at four different clubs he'd managed how many goals what the average goals per season was everyone switches off and laughs so keep it simple would be number one the second and this picks up on two points that both ian and daryl have made actually 
is about finding and using relevant data, you know, embracing your inner Simon Sinek and starting with why. Why am I setting out on this journey? Ian, you were talking an awful lot about this, um, but Daryl too, starting with why, knowing what your inquiry, what your analysis uh, and your narrative, not what it's going to be, but why you're doing it, you know, being properly you know, not making poor old Karl Popper spin in his grave. This is about hypothesis testing, not hypothesis proving. You know, Daryl, you're talking about about particularly um, uh, brand research. You know, just tell us what just tell us what the world is like, so we can carry on doing the same thing. That is so familiar, but not leading the interviewee. Hypothesis testing, um, as you say, Daryl, having a model to start, but finding and using relevant data. It doesn't necessarily. I, I mean, I agree with your point about you know, big or small, doesn't really matter. You've got to do something with it. But finding and using really relevant stuff. The third, because there's so much data available, the third would be to be careful when you make use of um, time series data. So time series data that you generate yourself, your sales, your seasonality of sales. But there's so much data available, um, weather data, G uh, GDP data, when you blend um, multiple data sources together, um, some that you control, some that you buy, some that are your customers' behavior, some that are your competitors, some that are meteorological, so it doesn't matter. These time series of data, when you blend those together, it's very, very easy to find false positives uh, and to think that something caused something else. You know, statistics is only correlation, correlation um, dressed up in many different ways. Um, but but, but if, you, if, if, you, if you've got a hunch, you know, this might cause this, um, uh, uh, the social media campaign that our ice cream sandwich, uh, that our social media company ran for our ice cream sandwich brand, they got lots of tweets, there was lots on Instagram, we sold lots, it must cause this. Think about what the hidden third causes are. There's a tremendous, um, started a Harvard law degree more than 10 years ago, a guy called Tyler Vegan. T-Y-L-E-R-V-I-G-E-N. He has a website called spuriouscorrelations.com where he, he maps, he's got, you know, wonderful, wonderful correlations like between um, people getting tangled in bed sheets uh, and consumption of cheese or, or, or divorce rate in Maine versus serving butter versus margarine. No connection whatsoever. So avoid false positives. Um, when you know a lot about something, the fourth I would say is when you know a lot about something, uh, you know a lot more than those that you're looking to influence about it, be they colleagues or clients or, or people in, in an audience when you're talking. There's this thing, the curse of knowledge. The Harvard psychologist Steve Pinker has written a book called The Sense of Style about 10 years ago, um, An Intelligent Person's Guide to Writing in the 21st Century. And he talks about the curse of knowledge. Now, the five professions that are most guilty of the curse of knowledge, and the curse of knowledge is not being able to put yourself in the mind of those that you're talking to, not being able to understand kind of quite how this could be. Academics, um, uh, people who work in pharma, government officials, financial advisors, and uh, civil servants, I think, is the fifth. They do not understand. They're unable not to bring themselves down to the level of. It's not about intelligence. It's about specificity of knowledge. So beware that curse of knowledge. We don't need to be taken on the working out journey. You don't need to show us all of the workings out. Ian and I, um, uh, we've often uh, historically laughed at, you know, what some of the bigger, shall we say, market research experts have put together. You know, slides one to 162 of uh, Google's corporate reputation this quarter. Has anything changed? What do we need to do as a result of it? Actually, talking of Google, Google have a rule for research feedback that you need to give them three slides. And on each bullet point, you can have on each slide, you can have no more than three bullet points. You can have as big an appendix as you want. That doesn't matter. But, you know, what really kind of so what now? What, what does the data mean and what should we do as a result? But that curse of knowledge that sharing too much, that taking the people on the journey. What you want to do is to stimulate people to say, that's interesting, that doesn't accord with my view of the world, how did you work that out? But not to try and browbeat people in, into submission. And then the last two are really flip sides of the same core, they're the same side maybe of, of a coin. And they're really about humanity and empathy. So who are you looking to influence in whatever way? Are they colleagues? Do you want to persuade your boss you need a pay rise? Do you want to 
tell the bank they shouldn't foreclose on you because, because uh, you know, under coronavirus. What, who, who do you need to persuade? Think about what their tolerance level is likely to be for data. Um, so know your audience, be empathetic, put yourself in their mind. Use the type of triggers, the, the type of factual data-driven triggers that are going to work with them and don't, and, and don't um, drown people. And then the last one would be to talk that very, very strange dialect that so few businesses, particularly tech, particularly business to business, but even business to consumer, talk. And that's human, that very strange dialect that we, that actually people respond to people, right? They, resp they respond to stories and story structure. They like you know, from Aristotle onwards, they like a beginning, a middle, and end, a thesis, an antithesis, and a synthesis. Story structure works. And I'm not saying try and force fit what, what your data into an artificial structure, but do realize how to tell a good story and use the data as the, as the not the bit part player, but the supporting player, rather than the hero that's taking you on the journey of that narrative. There you go, six ideas. Very, very well summed up. Um, I see Daisy has just uh, shared the link to the Spurious Correlations uh, blog. If, 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 yeah. if, if, if anybody is, is amused by that, I challenge you to get off that website in half an hour because he's got 30,000 Spurious Correlations there. <laughs> um, so uh, going back to, to Ian, uh, be interested to hear, uh, particularly with regards to what Sam was saying about um, you know, the principles of uh, specificity and simplicity. Um, any any projects that you've worked on where you've applied this kind of uh, kind of thinking using data? Well, I think um, uh, I mean there's lots of examples of, of, of clients where we we've helped them navigate and develop their their stories. Um, I think one of the more interesting ones um, is when you've managed to help a client. Um, so um, a large fashion brand, an American fashion brand, high street retail brand, um, uh, really move away from everything they were doing in terms of applying insight was based on transactional data. So they knew an awful lot about their customers based on how many went through their stores, how many bought um, different items, how many people came back, how they paid for it, all the stuff that you would expect that you, you know, through a, electronic point of sale you could find out about your customers and most of what they were doing was based on um, exactly that sort of trying to segment their market based on transactional data um, and the biggest thing they really didn't understand was really who their customers were and why they came into their stores and why they were buying the things that they were buying and it, it sort of sounds really quite um, unusual to say that that you know, you've got this huge huge brand um, upscale American um, fashion brand that um, relied almost in, exclusively on hard data um, to inform everything they did, but actually had no real idea of exactly who their customers were and why they were buying them. And so one of the things that we did with them was trying, we got them closer to the customer. We, we started helping them use data, which brought not just quantitative data, um, but actually qualitative data to help them understand why people were buying um, luxury and fashion, why they were buying the things that they did. And in order to do that, we had to do a number of things. We had to, first of all, as I was saying earlier, uh, really try and get them to appreciate um, the emotional side of what people were actually doing because um, this, they, they really didn't quite grasp the, um, uh, the sort of, uh, the different reasons that women would buy different types of fashion. Um, and so, you know, through taking people, um, taking consumers on sort of um, what we call brand safaris. So taking people to stores, but taking people around stores, doing what I was saying earlier, which is just observing them, talking to them in a very sort of tangential way, talking to them in much more immersive ways afterwards, to build up a picture of what they thought this brand was about and what they thought their products were about and what they thought they were good at and what they thought that you know they would be interested in buying or why they buy the stuff they do there and um the aim of all that was to help this 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 company look at um putting together a segmentation for their audience which was based not on what they buy and how much they buy but on the mindset with which people approach it so if you think about you know um sort of luxury fashion um 
there are many reasons why someone might buy a dress or a handbag, but it's going to be related to how you as an individual feel about your personal fashion style. What, and, and, you know, that can range through from um, really uh, people who are very uh, confident about making fashion choices, um, uh, but confident but often may want the same thing through to confident people who want completely different things every season through to people who are very, um, uh, say, um, unconfident or, or uh, reticent about choosing fashion because they might choose the wrong things. So one of the things we were doing with them was say, well, look, okay, let's, let's try and segment your audience. Let's look, let's delve much deeper into not the transactional side of stuff, but actually who people are that, that actually are buying your products. And uh, look at what their mindset is, not what they're actually doing, not who they are, um, not how much they spend, but let's look at what is their attitude towards um, uh, fashion in general, types of products that they're interested in. And through, um, uh, in paraphrasing this, through a, a large scale qualitative but quantitative and then not quantitative study, we're able to help profile an audience across Europe for their brand, which looked at developing six typologies of, of types of buyer based on their, their fashion mindset. But then the important thing is, well, okay, that's all very well, but actually, how do you how do you maximise that? How do you make that come to life? How do you make that real? And what you what we help them do in in a physical sense was actually develop an algorithm uh, and an app for um, tablet use within the retail environment, which meant that a store manager or a salesperson in inquiring of someone coming into the store by asking them maybe four or five questions. Um, we'd be able to get them to the point of understanding which typology of, of customer that was, whether they were someone who was extremely confident about their fashion, whether they were someone who was um, a real magpie about what they buy. And it meant that you could tailor then the sales conversation to what that person would want. So if you knew that someone was unconfident uh, about their fashion style, but they come and buy your products, um, what they would probably want this season is the updated version of what they had last time, or well, that would be the easiest route in for them. Whereas if it was someone who at the other end of the magpie end of, of the spectrum, if you like, um, you know they're not going to want what they had last time. They want the, the, the completely fresh and the completely new line. There's something that's very different. So I think, you know, building on that, you know, sort of, you know, brands have to look at, um, you know, always continually trying to inquire and be inquisitive of their, their customers to look at what, you know, what lies behind the transactional data. Let's look at what the emotional data and the behavioral data that you put on top of that is going to show you um and you know from that point on they were able therefore to make a, you know much more informed choices about you know what they put in their store windows um uh, what they put online in terms of uh the products that were going to be the right things for that audience and you could be much more specific in your crm and uh, direct targeting of customers Based on knowing what their what their what their actual sort of fashion typology is, so you know it's you know, one thing we must remember about insight and research is it's there for a reason. It's to try and help you make better decisions, not just to make you feel good about knowing stuff. You know, you actually want to do it because you want your company to grow, you want it to make money, you want to be able to uh, give great customer experiences. So everything we do has to be filtered through that lens of how this insight is going to help you achieve those things. Brilliant. Uh, Daryl, are we, are we free to interrupt or should, should we take another question for the moment? <laughs> no, that's absolutely fine. I've just, I've just been child bombed. Um, just a moment. I'm just going to... Um... <laughs> Sorry, just a moment. She can, she, Miss, you can stay there if you Why let me you talk. Give Daddy a big kiss. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Mm. Okay. Yeah. What that's was the... What was, was, oh, that's nice. Well. What was, no, that's absolutely fine. What was, what was the next question? Um, so I, we've talked a lot about um, so, you know larger brands and people with a, a lot of resources to to conduct this uh, this kind of work. And I'm conscious that uh, a lot of our audience today is is, is going to be working uh, smaller businesses. Um, so what what's your advice for someone with perhaps more more limited resources that's hoping to capture useful data and, and, and applicable? Uh, data it's a it's a really good question um don't be i think don't be misled by thinking that you need to spend an enormous amount of money on social listening and stuff unless you know that you 
uh, have an application for it and you have a purpose for it, which I think taps into everything that we've been saying previously. If you don't know why you're doing it, you probably don't need to do it. Um, from, from my experience, the simplest rules would be if you, if you want to get started in, in shaping your business around data, uh, probably the most rewarding place to start, both in terms of commercial uh, value and also because it's, um, it's actually quite satisfying to, learn, to start learning more about uh, prospects rather than simply what the, the audience out there is who uh, potentially are not going to be walking anywhere near your, near your door, is uh, focus on CRM. Start with, start with CRM, gather every bit of information you can about every transaction you have with the outside world, um, and then find a way of encapsulating that and building out your processes to support whatever you put in place. Because I know CRM's kind of the boring, the boring dog of, of data, but as a place to start, it's right at the center of your business because it's about the relationships you have across the customer journey. Um, it is simple and the benefits of having it, the benefits from doing it are immediately visible because you, you should see a sales uplift or you should see a conversion uplift or, 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 or whatever. If you don't, um, you'll certainly have evidence as to why that's not happening. So I, I'd say if you haven't got a CRM system, and again, that sounds about as exciting as having a finance system, but, but less so, um, but thankfully, CRM is a little, a little bit more fun to work with than it was a few years ago. Um, you don't have to go to something as dry as Salesforce. You can, you can use HubSpot or something of that ilk, which you can start light and uh, add as many integrations into it as you can be bothered with or can't be bothered with. Um, but it's, it's your data. It's about your customers. Um, and therefore, you will have a, or you should have an informed sense of how to use it without really having to stretch yourself beyond your comfort zone. It's already, it's already the world that you work in. You're simply quantifying it a little bit more and building processes where you can um, exploit that data for, for better results. So I'd say start with CRM. And um, if you are feeling like venturing into the world of uh, social listening and analytics, uh, of which I'm largely a skeptic in most areas, I think for, CRM social, it can be very, very useful. You can find people at decision points. You can find people who are asking the opinion of their, of their peers around purchasing decisions or, or life to stage decisions or, or whatever it is that you're, you're interested in. Um, and you can interact with them directly, should you choose to, um, to help them along their journey and hopefully build your brand and build your customer base. I think CRM is a really, really good place to start. Um, the other thing I would say is whatever else you've got, uh, that's instrumentable, whether that's your, your website or um, any experiments you're conducting in the market, um, try and, without going crazy about it, try and quantify what you, treat everything as an, as an experiment. Everything that you are doing in the market, um, you have a hypothesis about an outcome, you have a, a reason for doing it, uh, write them down. Uh, and as you progress what you're doing, uh, look at the results that you're getting. What would you say what your, your KPIs are? I mean, maybe it's the bottom line. Maybe it's you've got a, a better business, a bigger business pipeline. Maybe it's that you've got a certain percentage of certain segments um, converting or, or entering your pipeline. You know, maybe you're trying to upscale your business and sell to bigger, bigger customers, whatever it is. Um, keep track of what you're doing. And to the extent that you can put meaningful, for variables and what you're doing, business or this profile of customer, well, what happened to them? Where did they go? Um, change something? Did that change correlate with an improvement in what you're trying to do? Treat everything as an experiment. Keep it, keep it relatively simple, but to the extent that you can put numbers on things, do it. You mightn't get to a point where you want to process all of that and analyze all of that, but if you've got it, you can do. Um, it's like web analytics. Turn web analytics on on everything. You may not go to the, you may not want to or need to go to your dashboard on Google, Google Analytics and do country segmentation and do all of the other crazy stuff that you can do. But if you've collected the data, it's there when you want to. And if you're involving external suppliers at any point, if you've got that data, you can point them at it and make it their problem to work out what it means and tell you what to do. But if you haven't collected it, you're starting from zero. And it's the same with CRM. If you don't know who the people are who have been um, interacting with you historically, whether they came came and converted or whether they were really prospects for MLG, you're starting from zero at whatever point you decide to do that. So the sooner you start, even if you're not dedicating huge access or uh, huge resource to analyzing it and working out what to do with it, 
start collecting it so that you can get your feet wet when you choose to, rather than three months later, oh, we still don't actually have any data. So start with the stuff that's close. Um, and then if you want to get heavy with analytics or if you need to buy in big data to um, perform, so to build products or to, to, um, to um, Im improve some business function that you've got internally, this goes against everything that I would normally tell people, but find a consultant that knows what they're doing <laughs> and help to help you do it because it's so easy to get lost in the, in the forest of this stuff. Um, find people who have done it before that have got proven track record and um, use as little of their time as you possibly can to establish whether or not the path that you're thinking of following actually has any, any kind of, um, uh, support from previous experience or anybody else's previous experience and then try and do it in as minimal as possible a way rather than boiling the ocean otherwise again you can get lost in the complexities um, very very quickly and the last thing I would add on that is data science comes up in this almost immediately ah, we need data scientists um, all science requires data and Data is kind of as the data science as a, as a phrase. I, I I get quite disturbed by this. <laughs> it's it's semi meaningless. I think um, the two the two area the two groups of people that I have found the most useful in learning how real data science really works are astrophysicists and gamblers, professional gamblers, because they have to work with incredibly noisy data. They have to build incredibly um, sensitive systems to find advantage. And if you if you ever cross the paths with a professional ga professional gambler who is selling themselves as a, a data analyst or data scientist or somebody who's worked in astrophysics who is looking to to um, repurpose their career um, and they are available at a price you can afford, I would go for either of them before um, somebody who's just come out of university with a data science degree. Um, Semi jokingly, but it's it's that kind of a mindset that somewhere in there there, there is a signal um, and that. It's possible to find it, but as, as everyone has said, I think in the court, that's, that's so much of this stuff is creative work as well as it's, you know, as, as science is experimental science. A lot of it is very, very creative work. Um, and you need people who've got a proven track record of, of looking into the noise and finding something meaningful. So um, track records, if you're getting external people in count for everything, rather than simply the, the sorry, recent graduates, but um, find people that have actually done stuff in the world um, that's related to what you're doing. Um, and double check that what they've done is actually um, of value. Otherwise you can um, easily go down a path that doesn't have an end and doesn't really have a purpose. Daryl, can I just ask, can I just ask a, a question on, on your, your I, I love your, your astrophysicists and uh, professional gamblers. The reason for, for them is because the signal, there's, there's more noise in those two fields and weaker signals, is that right? Weaker, we, weaker signals and people who, in my experience, people who work in those fields, um, if they are successful, they have been, they are both very, very pragmatic and very skilled in building uh, workflows for extracting what I, what I'm calling the, the feed, I'm not, not talking about signals and noise, but extracting the features from the signal that you can actually read through the noise. Um, and I have been vastly impressed by the people I've encountered in both of those worlds who, who, who have actually been successful for the, the strategies that they've found in taking, you know, taking the, the information from a, a distant black hole and saying something useful about it or finding a way of beating the house uh, playing blackjack um, through very, very, very uh, oh. complex maths um, and have demonstrated that they can actually do it. It's a, it's a significant achievement and also a transferable skill in my experience. Um, those people have a way of looking at data that um, uh, the data fears them, which I think is a good thing. Excellent. And incidentally, if uh, you're wondering where on earth do I find myself an astrophysicist, uh, we do a lot of work with the Data Intensive Science Centre at the University of Sussex, which a large proportion of their team is, uh, is from the astronomy department. Um, so there's quite a few kind of PhDs. Grab them. Get them, yeah. get them, get them while they're hot. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so if anyone does want an introduction there, then we're, we're happy to arrange that. Also, also I, uh, uh, full, di full disclosure, my business partner is a, um, has a, a doctorate in astrophysics and uh, is very, very good at uh, finding signals. <laughs> so um, I'm biased. You, you, uh, you live by your words. Um, 
So, I do live by my word. <laughs> Um, we, we've got uh, some questions coming in. Please, uh, please do start uh, firing more over. We'll be uh, uh, handling audience questions for uh, the rest of this session. Um, just one from uh, Mike Orchards just comes through. Hi, Mike. Um, I think this was in reference to uh, something Sam said about uh, data tolerance. Uh, and do, do you have a, a rule of thumb that you, you would follow in kind of mapping uh, someone's level of data tolerance against different kind of types of stakeholder or? Uh, not, I mean, I, I, only a rule of thumb that would say, um, uh, do your homework before, you're, before you go into the room, head onto the Zoom meeting, stand up in front of people. Um, and if you're talking to your chief financial officer and their team, their data tolerance is likely to be a little bit higher than let's say the coloring in department as marketing is sometimes known um, uh, there's likely to be a, a higher degree of i say that of somebody who's worked for 30 years in, in marketing services so you know i'm, I'm painting myself with that brush uh, even if i did have a little lacuna back at the university of sussex doing a master's and a doctorate in experimental psychology but you know i'm, I'm, a, I'm a marketeer really um, uh, but um, i mean kind of, kind of um, common sense work what you know work out who's going to be in the room don't necessarily think that, that this is a lowest com common denominator thing some people like to be challenged um, ask you could you can map people you know you could you could easily map them you could have a you could create a, a nice um, you could create a nice matrix to map the type of people you're going to be talking to um, ask them I mean you know people people will have regularly recurring um, uh, meetings and debriefings and that might be a series of projects with the same client or it might be um, a quarterly analysis of, of uh, reputation data um, doesn't matter what it is um, ask them uh, how, how was that for you um, what how do you like to receive information um, some people don't, some people want uh, uh, infographics some people want tables ask ask them you know that you're working with them work with them um, in partnership and also I mean I think this is this is this is uh, an old kind of consultative sales training trick um, but it works like catnip um, at the beginning of the set uh, of a feedback session when you're sharing what insights you believe you've got from the data make an upfront contract say look I don't want to drown you in data, but we've got some really important findings. If it's all right with you, I'd like to take, we've got an hour together, great. I'd like to take 20 minutes to, to, to take you through what we found and what we think this means. Then we can have a discussion for half an hour. And then with 10 minutes left at the end, I'd just like to, I'd just like to get your feeling on, on you know, what the balance of, of our, our feedback and discussion was like. And you make that upfront contract and you set yourself a little alarm and you make sure you know 10 minutes before the end and you you stick to that contract i mean it's you know this is this is a this is a kind of this is kind of putting rules and architecture around what it's like to be a human being in a business in a business context but that little upfront contract if you stick to that upfront contract i think you're likely to be able particularly with people that you see regularly uh um uh, then you're likely to get a, a better reading and a better understanding. You know, it's, it, I work with a lot of businesses who are terribly embarrassed to go to their clients and ask them, can we write a case study about this piece of work? Well, if you say to a client, the, which is, you, can be quite useful, right? You know, you have got a case study, you know, oh, I've worked with somebody like you before. Let me, let me tell you about this. Um, if you say to, you know, in the, in the first flush of romance of the beginning of a new relation, business relationship, do you know what? We're really proud of the work we do and we think we can do some fantastic work with you guys. Um, I'd like to say, if, if, we, if, if, if it works out as, as we believe it can, can we write a case study about you? Of course you can, rather than you know, it's coming up to awards, it's coming up to, to the end of the year, or you're, it's coming, you, you've, got, you've, suddenly, you've suddenly been asked, you know, you need to crank out five case studies, by the end of the year oh well, I don't think I can possibly ask my clients if we can share it'll be too commercially sensitive ask them at the beginning and say this is what the, the routine way we like to do it sure of course we, if, if, if we have a great time together I'd love you to shout it from the rooftops um, I'd love you to show off about it um, in exactly the same way ask the people that you're feeding data back to say to them look um, uh, we'd like to we'd like to do this better so that you get most value out of it 
can you give us a frank and honest appraisal? Don't be afraid. You know, they'll just say, you had 400 too many charts and never, never open your laptop ever again. If that's the rule, if that's the heuristic that works for them, perfect. Yeah, can I add a, a, a caveat to that? Well, not a caveat, an extra to that as well. So it's very useful if you have the machines do the 400 charts that are the data and you do the five charts that are the inside. If you end up having to do the 400 charts manually and never present them, that is just a total time waste. So if you're choosing platforms and systems, find, find ones that will do all of the appendices, all of the supporting stuff for you, and then concentrate on doing the, the bit that's the inside. Because um, some platforms you discover you've actually got to do the 400 charts yourself as well, and that just does not work. <laughs> it's not cost effective. I think that's a brilliant And point. also you feel, you feel compelled to present them. If, you, if, if you've actually done them yourself, you feel compelled to present them, which is wrong. <laughs> and one, one other aspect actually that um, we probably haven't talked about in terms of storytelling is um, the power of visuals and um, uh, a lot of the time actually you are much more effective at getting your message across to people by actually showing them the visual of, of, of the piece of insight that you're um, that you're, you're trying to uh, get across and what I mean by that is you know in a lot of the work we do for example um, is uh, you know, video work um, uh, and sort of self-curated work where people are telling their your consumers are telling their own stories through um, uh, you know mobile technology um, become a really powerful way of getting a message across um, in a way that putting a slide up and saying you know x proportion of people thought this or um, you know this is the main finding that we've had about how people deal with this product um, a lot of the time putting up um, short snippets and visuals and um, t literally they're telling the story through through pictures a picture tells a thousand same as a thousand words is, is, is very opposite because people do respond very well to that and um, it's an in, I think an integral part of the whole storytelling process I'm really glad you said that because that was going to be my my uh, last question actually um, uh -huh. uh, conscious of time so uh, just just as a, a quick speed round uh, before we finish up, um, what are some of the best uh, tools that, and particularly free tools uh, that you would recommend for uh, putting together great data visuals? Anyone on the panel? Um, there are, I, I tell you what, there are plenty, or if we're talking at a practical level, there are, there are an amazing number of apps um, uh, which are inexpensive uh, and free available on the web um, that really help you put together compelling um, stories and, and charts. Um, and uh, you're going to ask me for the name and instantly it's gone from the top of my head to what it's called. Um, but I'll put it in the chat if I, if I got it. Um, I think it might be, I think it's called Infographia, um, uh, which are, you know, uh, a set of um, adaptable templates, but really compelling sort of visuals that, you know, help you just get your can help you get your story across which don't cost a lot but they look really good um and um they also inspire you in some ways to actually think about how you should present stuff because i think a lot of people do find it quite difficult to think about how am i going to tell this story what am i what's it going to look like how am i going to get this message across and some of these things are actually really good at just being quite thought-provoking getting you to think about you know what what's going to be the most compelling way of you know telling that story or that piece of data or, or whatever else um, so there are lots of sort of um, inexpensive um, uh, apps that you can use to self help embody the physical presentations. Um, the other one is your brain. Um, you know, it's really good actually. Um, it, it can, just taking a step back and actually think about, well, have, just as Sam was saying earlier, you know, Google have this thing about sort of like you can only have three slides and they can only have three points on them or whatever. Um, it's you know, sitting back and actually just really consolidating with yourself what it is that you want to say. And putting it down and funneling it like that um, is really really effective and um, uh, in the same way that actually one point I was going to mention about you don't need to do a lot of research sometimes to come up with really compelling insights it's not always about the scale of insight and research that you do it's about the depth and the immersion that you have with people and the conversations that you have with people and that can be a really sort of compelling way to sort of start you thinking about what you should do Brilliant. Um, I think that's a, uh, a great place for us to, uh, to wrap up our discussion for the day. Um, Daisy has posted a link which 
she believes may be the infographia you were talking about uh, <laughs> in the chat. Um, we will be uh, okay. sending a follow-up email uh, after the session to all the attendees um, and including uh, any any links or anything that we mentioned that we uh, we didn't manage to get you a link to. Um, I am just going to share my screen one more time. Um, so, uh, as uh, as those of you tuned in earlier uh, will be aware, um, we are able to bring you these sessions thanks to uh, funding from the European Regional Development Fund. Um, and another aspect of that is that we at Sussex Innovation are available to help you with funded consultancy packages uh, to support any of the issues that we've uh, and challenges that we've been discussing as part of these uh, Survive and Thrive sessions. Uh, I think Daisy is going to be posting several links in the chat as I speak. Uh, so uh, first uh, is a newly launched uh, product called Lead Out of Lockdown. Um, which is a, a set of new consultancy packages uh, with our team, looking at things like how to manage your team effectively, um, how to uh, derive insight from market research um, and analyze trends. Uh, we've got marketing and, uh, and comms and media training as part of that as well, um, and getting your finances and cash flow in order. So. Lots, uh, lots to look at there. Um, we also are offering access to grants at the moment, uh, both for the protection of IP and the development of innovation. Um, so if you're working on any projects where you could use a little bit of match funding to, uh, to support the work you're doing, then uh, do get in touch. Um, and we're also looking to grow our membership at the moment. Uh, so if you are or if you are friends with anyone who's in an ambitious startup or scale up who you think might be interested in working with us, then please do refer them. And yes. if they become a member, then you'll receive some credit to spend with us on our consultancy services as a nice little perk for you. Um, keep an eye on our Eventbrite where we'll be posting the upcoming webinars in this series uh, and also can visit our YouTube page and uh, our website for all of the past webinars in this series. So all that uh, remains for me is to, uh, to thank our guests today. Thanks Sam, Daryl and Ian uh, for all of your really valuable insight and advice. Um, and next week's webinar, I'm just being, I'm just hearing now, is uh, <laughs> is Survive and Thrive on uh, the importance of building diverse teams. So do please join us for that next week. Uh, thanks Thank for you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Bye. Take care. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks, guys.